Today on the Whole Person Podcast, we have Daniel Blue, not to be mistaken for Daniel Red. He is a regular contributor to Forbes.com and is the owner of Quest Education, a company that helps entrepreneurs obtain capital for their companies, pay off high interest debts, and make money tax-free using self-directed retirement accounts. Under Daniel's leadership, Quest Education has reached seven-figure mark in just two years. He's done it consistently and is in all 50 states. His story is unique in a sense that he had a daughter when he was 19 and he overcame an addiction to Oxycontin, which I hated Oxycontin when I was on it, at 20 years old. Those two life-changing moments helped shape the man who Daniel is today. Daniel, welcome to the Whole Person Podcast. How are you? I'm good, Evan. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. No worries, man. Man, Oxycontin, some pretty powerful stuff there. Man, I uh, I consider myself blessed. I was uh, pretty heavy into it in 2007, 2008, and uh, I got clean uh, right around 2009, 2010. And I'm just grateful that I was doing drugs back then. Now you read people overdosing on fentanyl and it's just these drugs have just evolved and uh it's really sad to see the situation out there addiction is it's real i'm sure people listening either a friend family member someone in their circle they know has been yeah. you know down that dark path so it's, it's real life now i always get confused here so forgive my stupidity and ignorance uh is oxycontin the the prescription that like the a painkiller or is that oxycodone yeah. So basically, you know, you hurt your back or there's just some pain you're experiencing, depending on the pain level, they're going to give you maybe Loratab, uh, maybe Percocet. Th- those are uh, pills that are not as strong. Um, and then the, the Oxycontin, Oxycodone, that, that's in a separate family. And, and that stuff's just hardcore, it's basically okay. heroin in a pill. Wow. Yeah, no, it. Uh, so I had knee surgery a few years ago. And whichever one they gave me, it caused me to, my heart started racing. And I legitimately thought I was going to have a heart attack. Like I did not like it at all. So no joke. I think once I realized, because I thought it was anxiety, but once I realized it was the the pills that I was taking, uh, I stopped taking painkillers like the day after knee surgery. Like I just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. And so it was, yeah, it was something. <laughs> but okay. It made my heart race. And so I thought, I, oh, dude, I thought I was having a heart attack. Anyway, enough about that. Daniel, tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are in your background. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in a, a family with a, a mom and a dad, lived in a cul-de-sac, middle class family in California. And then uh, things really changed for me when I was 12. When I was 12, my parents got divorced. Uh, but what made the situation unique is my dad ended up moving to Mexico. Uh, so from the age of 12 on, I was raised by my mom. My mom was a social worker, worked all day, wasn't home much, leaving me at home. And uh, I started running the streets and making bad choices and just was a knucklehead during middle school and high school and uh, barely barely passed and uh, didn't really have ambition or goals didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And then uh, I signed up for college, right? That's what society tells us to do, go to college. And uh, just by networking, I was able to land a sales job at 18 years old. And I did not grow up wanting to be in sales. That was not something on my radar. Uh, but I ended up jumping on the phones and uh, just smiling and dialing and was able to excel in sales and was able to go from you know, a, a setter pounding the phones on the front line to becoming a closer, um, then having my own team and then running the sales floor and uh, was able to evolve. And uh, I'm 32 years old today and uh, I own a company with uh, 14 employees. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, our mission, what we do is we help people access money in their retirement accounts, penalty and tax free. That's awesome. And so you, let's just dive into that because it's my understanding of retirement accounts that it's very hard to access money from that without it being penalty. So what are the parameters or aspects that you help your clients with to be able to do that? Yeah. So 
if there's a 401k from an old job, let's just say you worked corporate, you saved money in a 401k and you left that job. You're no longer tied to that employer anymore. That 401k, you can actually take and, and you can transfer it. You can convert it into what's called a self-directed retirement account. And then from there, you have a lot of options on where you can invest the money. Maybe you want to invest into private lending or um, private companies, private equity. Um, maybe you have a fir- I'm sorry? Bitcoin? Yeah, crypto all day long. Uh, precious metals. Um, maybe you want to purchase a, a piece of property, maybe some land, maybe a, a single family house and flip it. So you could do all of these different cool transactions within your retirement account as long as it's self-directed and it can be done without triggering a taxable event. So it can essentially grow tax-free or tax-deferred, however you have it set up. So if it's a 401k from an old job or an IRA, either of those accounts technically can get converted into a self-directed account. That's awesome. So let's pretend that I don't have an IRA or a 401k. I've talked to a lot of people. I think we, you know, we're chatting about this. You know, we deal with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and I think everyone knows an entrepreneur that has the mentality of my retirement account is my business right? Like they're putting everything into their business and uh, you can hit home runs that way, right? I mean, you can really set yourself up for the future. You could sell that company and, and, and realize the gain of millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? But at the end of the day, it doesn't hurt to have dollars in, in other places. And retirement accounts, they have a, a bad rap, rap, bad rap. I would say more so like 401ks with a job. I hear a lot of people are like, man, 401ks are a scam. You know, they're worthless. They suck. And if you're at a job, (laughs) yeah, I mean, it just comes down to how is that 401k set up? Um, Do you get a good amount of options to invest? Like, do they give you different ETFs or stocks or mutual funds? Like, is it a, a big menu or is it small? Like you said, do they match? If they do, how much? So you want to find out some of that information before you, you know, make an opinion. Um, I, I always think it's a good idea that people, especially if they're younger in their 20s, start now. Uh, I would highly take advantage of a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. Roth just means the money that you put in the account. You pay taxes on it. You claim it as income. But then that money grows tax-free. So let's just say you put $5,000 into Tesla stock in a Roth IRA. And you just follow me for this example. And then let's just say 20 years from now, that $5,000 were to grow to $50,000. Now that money is 100% tax-free. So you paid taxes on the seed, but you didn't pay taxes on the harvest. And uh, I'm a big proponent of Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, because I'd rather pay taxes now I don't care if you voted for Trump, voted for Biden. I think we all could agree, no matter what your political affiliation is, taxes are not going to be going down over the next three, five, maybe 10 years, right? So I'd rather pay taxes now and and avoid that huge tax hike that is inevitable. There's only one political party that loves taxes. That's how they make their money. Not the party, but the government. (laughs) Anyway, I'm having a little fun with that. If you're a Democrat, don't cancel me. I'll just give you guys a hard time. And so, for me, I started a Roth years ago, and I put 100 bucks in it, and I've actually never looked at it since. Uh, but I recently this year started putting money into crypto versus a Roth IRA, um, more than anything, just for the gains. And that way that I have access to it because you were talking about something that that's near and dear to my heart. It's self-directed and with, uh, with the way that I'm wanting to set up my lifestyle is I want to be able to move it from, if not a 401k, sorry, from crypto to land to whatever strategy I want to use at the time, because I don't want to be stuck in one box. And so how does uh, a self-directed IRA kind of work in that scenario? Like if I'm not rolling anything over and I just, let's say I put, let's say I take all my money I'm going to make up a fictitious number here. Let's let's say I got $20,000 and I put it in a self-directed IRA. 
and then you know the price of Bitcoin drops low. Am I able then to take that money out of that self-directed IRA and put it in crypto? Yeah, so without getting too much in the weeds, um, I always think it's a good idea that people have two buckets of money. They've got their retirement account money, and then they've got their non-qualified money. Non-qualified is just bank account money, not tied to an IRA, it's not tied to a 401k. Without getting too much in the weeds, an IRA and a 401k are the two main types of retirement plans. A Roth IRA and a, and a Roth 401k, there are some ways to pull the money out without having to pay penalties and taxes. There are ways to do that. Um, but just for the sake of this conversation, I think it's a good idea to have money in, in two different buckets because let's just use you as an example here. You've got money in, in crypto. And if I followed you correctly, that money is not tied to an IRA or 401k, right? Correct. So if you were to sell and realize that gain, you're going to have to claim that as income. There's a taxable event that's triggered. You as the could, government. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So you technically could do that same investment, crypto investment, held inside of a self-directed IRA or 401k. And if you sold, there is no taxable event that's triggered. And then now that, that sale that takes place, it now turns into cash inside your IRA or 401k, and then you can move on to the next deal. Um, but just calling a spade a spade, if you have money in a non-qualified account that's not tied to an IRA or 401k, it's going to be easier for you to access your money. When right. you take money out of your back pocket, it's going to be easier. That's the pro. The con is every time you take money out of your back pocket, Uncle Sam is, is, is knocking on your door. Yeah. Or, and that's why I like to have money in both buckets because my retirement money, it, I can access it in some ways. There's some caveats without paying the penalties and taxes, but it's not as flexible as my non-qualified money. However, I'm not having to claim it as income. There's no taxable event that's triggered. So I, you want to use both, in my opinion. Okay. So in a self-directed IRA, let's say I wanted to buy a homestead and have 10 acres, 20 acres, whatever, and have a, like a micro farm or whatever. Would that be considered an investment? Yeah. So this is where you walk into the territory of prohibited transactions so your retirement account cannot actually own a piece of property and then you live in it. Okay. Um, you can't rent it out to lineal descendants. Um, you can't do any of the rehab on your own. You have to hire a third party. So there are some restrictions. Um, I always tell people it's a lot easier when you, if you're going to do real estate inside of a self-directed account, it's a lot easier. It's set up to be, so much easier if you're doing passive investments. If you're just a part of a syndication, maybe you invest with Grant Cardone or your buddy that flips houses, like you're just a bank. You're just lending money, private lending, syndication, and that's just easy peasy. Uh, as soon as you start doing active deals, like buying a property, trying to flip it, rent it out, it can be done. It's just there's going to be more, more rules you have to follow per the IRS. That makes sense. So let's talk about where we're at as a country financially, because one of my concerns with putting money in a IRA, Roth IRA, other investments that are specifically backed by the US dollar right now is that you know, we've seen a rate of inflation of about 25% in the last 100 days you know, in 2021. And that's very concerning to me. I know we've seen inflation on and off through obviously uh, the U.S. existence. But what a lot of people don't know is that there was a time where it was a, a colonial dollar where America uh, went through hyperinflation and then that money became invalid and not useful. It was just paper. And we're on the same track to having that happen again, especially with how much printing is going on. And so what we've done is, you know, my wife has her 401k through work. We have um, precious metals. And my other aspect is, like, well, instead of me putting in a, a 401k or Roth IRA, uh, put it in crypto. That way it's a digital asset because I don't want to buy a bond. I don't want to, you know, I want something that's decentralized that can't be manipulated by more printing, although Bitcoin is still very 
man- manipulated by tweets from Elon Musk and <laughs> other individuals. But, you know, I think the, the sky's the limit for digital currencies here in the near future. What, what are your thoughts with what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, if, you, if you look at, there's only so many places where we can invest our money, right? We can leave our money under the mattress, but then we both know what's going to happen, right? You've got taxes, you've got inflation, so that's not helping. Um, and then you have other places to invest your money. Most people are familiar with the stock market, um, and, and I'm not here to beat up on the stock market. I'm just not a big fan of having my money in the stock market because there's just so much out of my control. Mm-hmm. Um However, I'm a big proponent of alternative investments. And uh, if we're investing in alternative ways, such as crypto, precious metals, um, you know, maybe real estate that is geared towards a certain sector, and you know, maybe like uh, assisted living, you know, maybe there's people listening right now that think there's a, a big demand in the, the healthcare space, the, you know, the retiree space. And it's only um, going to get more, actually, that, yeah, that, that because it, of the baby boomers. Exactly. So, you know, inflation is, is most likely going to happen. Uh, I think we all knew it was going to take place. So it's just a matter of knowing, okay, how, how can I combat this? And if you have an IRA or a 401k with Fidelity or Vanguard or TD Ameritrade, you're just limited to stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, REITs, bonds, right? That's the only arena that you can play in. And that's why a lot of people gravitate towards a self-directed retirement account because they're like, oh shoot, I could use my retirement account to invest outside the stock market because I think this industry, that industry, and this other industry can combat inflation. I'm I'm in. I'm game. It's just this is not taught. Financial advisors and CPAs, they don't teach people the self-directed retirement account arena. And it's not like it's some brand new retirement account that just came out last year. I mean, this has been around for decades. It's part of the IRS code. This is 100% legitimate um, for reasons that are tied to money. Um, it's just not talked about by Wall Street. Yeah, that makes sense. So what have I not asked you that I should have asked you by now? Um, I mean, you did mention that uh, there's people on here that uh, are entrepreneurs listening. Um, I would say, and I'm just going to use this based off of our existing clients. You know, I've got clients in all 50 states. Um, A lot of my clients are entrepreneurs. A lot of them are just getting started. And uh, the idea of being able to tap into their retirement account penalty and tax-free once they learn, it appeals to them when maybe they need extra capital for their business. Like one of our clients, she is crushing it uh, with Amazon. She's selling a bunch of different product, beauty product, um, just different inventory that she's able to to sell. And she uses her retirement account to purchase product, flips the product, makes money, right? So she's not going into debt on a 20% interest rate credit card to fund her in her business. She's using her retirement account. And her line of thought is, Well, I would rather use some of my retirement account dollars to invest in myself. At least I have more control versus having my retirement account invested into this stock that I have no say in. Um, So that's her train of thought. Maybe someone listening to this right now, the idea of accessing 10, 15, $20,000 in capital to help your business get started or help your business scale. And you have a 401k from an old job or an IRA, and maybe that's hitting home right now. Um, I also can't tell you enough, Evan, how many people we talk to that have $50,000 $50,000 in a retirement account that's making them six, seven, eight percent a year in the stock market. Meanwhile, they have their credit card debt that's costing them 20% interest. Yeah. And that, that's scary because if you're losing 20% on your credit card debt and you're only making 8% on your money, and you're losing money agent. faster than me. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So when we explain the strategy of accessing money from your retirement account penalty and tax free, we have a lot of clients that will have a light bulb moment where they're thinking, well, it makes a lot of sense for me to take this money that I'm only making 6% and take this retirement money, maybe 20,000, how much, however much they owe in credit card debt, take that 20,000 from the retirement account penalty and tax free. And then they pay off their credit card debt in one shot. So now they're not losing 20% interest. Their credit score goes up because their utilization rate went down. And then the money they took out of their retirement account to pay off their credit card debt, they're actually replenishing their retirement account. So they're actually paying themselves back. So they're not going to have so much opportunity cost. They're not going to raid their their future, so to speak. 
Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it just comes down to what people's goals are. Um, you know, I'm, I've got a, we've got a let's, pretty big. Uh, let's do this. How how should people? Let's say. Let's say, we have someone who wants to be wise with their money, but their financial goal is to be financially free. But other than that, they don't have much else. So, how can we go about defining? financial goals and how we should realize them. I mean, I I think it comes down to just base breaking it down to the basics, right? Like what do you want your lifestyle to look like for yourself now in the future? And what do you want the lifestyle to look like when you pass, when you die? Right. I mean, I've had clients tell us like, Hey, for my beneficiary, for my million dollar IRA, I don't want to leave my family shit. And hopefully I can cuss like they leave their, their money to a trust or a charity. Like they don't, they don't care so much about legacy. They're not trying to leave stuff behind. Uh, and then I have other clients that want to leave money behind for their families. Right. So I think that's important to define is what your lifestyle, what, what do you want that to look like for you while you're on this earth? And then is that something that you want to consider when you pass? right? Death is inevitable. And uh, people need to think about that in terms of when they pass their kids or their grandkids or their siblings and uh, just being okay with where you're at now and realizing, okay, do I want to maybe live more within my, my means and save more now so I can have a better future? And then there's other people that are thinking, well, shoot, you know, I don't think I'm going to live past this age. So I want to be able to go on this cruise and go you know, visit this country. People that always live the longest. <laughs> I know, right? That's my, just, uh, dude, my grandmother, she was a chain smoker, like heavily smoker. And she died in her late eighties, not from smoking, from dementia. And it was just, dude, like she just, now I'm not saying that if you're a chain smoker, you're going to live in your eighties, but I'm just saying, like she, yeah. she, she looked terrible. But <laughs> She's still smoking. Yeah. Well, not anymore. She gone. Yeah. 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 But anyway, so so let's say you start defining your goals and what you want to do. I think probably the next step is, I mean, want to take action. You know, I recently had a lady on who talks about legacy planning and to um, come up with a will and a trust and, you know, to go down that route that way, if something were to happen, that there are plans drawn out. And what I didn't know, but here in the state of Oklahoma, if we die, my wife and I, and there's no plan for our kids, guess who gets to decide? The state does. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so important. Um, so our, our company really stays in our lane. Um, you know, what we do really, really good at and what our, our mission is, is to educate people on self-directed retirement accounts and, and helping people set those accounts up. Um, but what we've found over the years is there's people that have a lot of financial needs and um, we want to be able to help those people in, in the best way. And what we have found is building a, a trusted network of referral partners, affiliates, uh, that we can introduce our, our clients to. So, you know, we do work with a referral partner out in the East Coast. Um, he's an attorney. He does estates, uh, trusts, wills, and and you hit the nail on the head. Like it's it's pretty it's scary if if you pass and you don't have your estate planning in place. Now your assets are being tied up with the government, and now the government. We all know the government doesn't operate like the Chick Fil A drive through line, right? They're not that efficient. So Dude, they're you going to take a long. You know, you know why. <laughs> Chick-fil-A has such a great drive-through. It's because of God. <laughs> They're heavenly. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, I mean, they have I divine imagine, intervention. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I, I imagine uh, they would be having a, a lot more revenue if they were open on Sunday, but hey, it works for them and uh, they've got a great business model. I, I love going there. Oh, yeah. I love it. They got great food. Yeah. Well, man. Do you have a podcast called How Winners Win? Tell us a little bit about why you created that podcast. Yeah, so uh, I think there's a lot of parallels between business and sports. 
Um, I think people listening could probably relate. Maybe you play baseball, maybe you played basketball, football, and uh, business is the same, right? There, there's losing, there, there's failure, there's learning to work with others and communication, and there's also winning. And, and part of winning is going through adversity and, and challenges. And uh, I just felt compelled to be able to bring information to the public. And podcast is a great way to get people to kind of get a, a sneak peek and a better understanding of, of what we're doing as a company. Um, I try to keep it real, raw, authentic. Um, you know, I'm 32 years old. I don't have it all figured out. But with 14 employees and clients in all 50 states, you know, I go through a lot of challenges, right? Yeah. Hiring, culture, operations, systems, marketing, sales. Um, and then obviously we're experts in the financial space, but I didn't want to have a podcast where I just talk about self-directed retirement accounts. Um, that I feel like that would just bore people. So instead I wanted to talk about oh. just self-development. Yeah, exactly. I just want to talk about, you know, issues and challenges and adversity that people face on a personal level and then also a business level and yeah. be able to, you know, help people um, get that much closer to, to developing a, a winning mentality and just help them win more. You bet, man. Well, I like to end each show with the same three questions. Okay. I'm going to rapid fire these. Okay. I want, I want the first thing that comes to the top of your head. All right. In terms, of, in terms of negative self-talk, what do you currently struggle with? I look terrible on camera. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I feel you. Yeah, if I had your glasses, I'd, I'd feel better. <laughs> they need optical. Do you, do you wear glasses? No, I don't. Just sunglasses. I don't have uh, glasses just yet. Knock on wood. Right. Yeah, what brings you peace? The gym. Define that more. Why? Waking up at 4 or 5 a.m., uh, going to the gym, get my workout in. That's where I can just zone out, either listen to podcasts and audible. If I'm feeling a different kind of mood, I'll, I'll put on some music, get my workout in. And it just gives me time to just have clarity and uh, just not – be in, 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 uh, the chaos, right. I, I'm in the moment and, uh, I get done working out and then I go to the pool, do my, my sauna shower, walk out feeling like a champ. Dude, it sounds like, time. sounds like you and I have a similar regime except the 4am part. I'll go work <laughs> out, I'll go swim. I'll get in the hot tub. I'll go to the sauna and then I go home. Isn't that, so are you dry sauna or, or steam room? Steam. Okay. So I, I like to start off with the steam and then I'll go in the, in the dry sauna. And, uh, but yeah, it's, isn't it great? Oh, dude, I love it. I really, really do. I uh, haven't been back to, I went back to the gym today for the first time in two weeks and uh, just kind of got off track for a few weeks. But man, it's like, I started swimming again. I was like, wow, this isn't like riding a bike. <laughs> like after the, yeah. you know, I was doing 20 laps. I could barely get 10 in today. It was yeah. exhausting. Yeah. But that's after hey. already a full workout though. Just keep in mind. Yeah. Get it. Get it. I love it. Um, so just out of curiosity, what is, what is your uh, sleeping schedule like if you're waking up at 4 a.m.? Are you pretty consistent at that, at that time? Yeah. 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 I How mean, do you do that? On, the, on the weekends, I'll, uh, I'll go to the gym about six. So on the weekdays, I'm there at about five, five fifteen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in bed early, man. I'm in bed right about nine to 10 o'clock. That's that's my bedtime. Even on a Friday night, Saturday night, nine to ten, that's my sweet spot. Gotcha. Are you boring? Am I boring? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I could be a, a boomer, so to speak. I get the Wall Street Journal delivered to my house every day, so I, I, I like to actually touch the paper and read it. Um, but I, I wouldn't call myself boring, man. I got a twelve-year-old daughter. She I bet that's on my toes. Yeah. I got yeah, three boys, six three and seven months. Yeah. Was, they, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm a goofball, you know, I, I, I try not to take myself too seriously. Um, but I'm, I'm driven, man. Like business is, is, is a game and I'm trying to win. Um, you know, I'm trying to be the best version of myself and always grow and, and deliver value to the marketplace, my clients, uh, you know, people that, uh, we could possibly help people that we could impact. So I'm pretty focused uh, some people might call it boring because I'm not at the bar on a Friday night, but, uh, that's, that's cool. People you know, can do. I, I agree with you because I'm, I'm very much the same way. I struggle with waking up at four in the morning. Uh, 
but I live a very repetitive and boring lifestyle myself as well. Yeah. And I love it and I am okay with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think. You know what? Yeah, and I was saying boring tongue in cheek because everything that you're saying is like a mirror. I mean, we have similar hair color. You yeah. know, we're wearing the exact same color of shirt. Like, I feel like I'm almost looking into a mirror a little. Except you look, <laughs> you look a lot better than I do in the camera. Um, and I have white glasses, so whatever. <laughs> but anyway, what what's the best decision you've ever made? Mm, getting off drugs. Mm. That uh, that was huge. That uh, that was hard to do, but uh, it, it's something that I'm grateful for every single day. I'm grateful for the addiction process because it taught me a lot. And then uh, obviously, you know, people that are abusing drugs, they're just not themselves. They're you know li- living in a really dark place. So um, now I'm able to li- live a life I want to live and be able to chase my potential and, and be a better person. So that's that was hands down the best decision I made. That's awesome, man. Where can people follow you? Um, so How Winners Win is our podcast on iTunes, Spotify. Uh, that's a great place to get some, uh, some insight on the, yeah, on, on who I am and what I'm about. Um, you can always go to DanielBlue.me. Uh, DanielBlue.me. That is my personal website. I've got uh, a ton of information there. And then I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, again, my name is Daniel Blue, Blue Like the Color. And uh, I'm in Las Vegas. I am not aware of anyone else that's Daniel Blue in Las Vegas. So if you see someone by that name, um, you know, I'm, I'm hey. here to, uh, yeah, here to entertain and inspire. Well, it was funny that, you know, when I, when I asked you uh, if you're boring and you live in Las Vegas, um, I, dude, Vegas is crazy. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. And, uh, it is, man. You get distracted. So cool. Yeah, you. I, I appreciate that. I've been here 12 years. So uh, people laugh at this story, but I was uh, abusing drugs in St. George, Utah, about two hours away. And part of what helped me get clean is I decided to move. I, I left St. George and I decided I needed to change the scenery. Like I tried to get clean four or five times and it just was not working. And I, I just said, you know what? I need to change the scenery. I need a new phone number. I need a new city. I need to be somewhere I don't know anyone. So I decided to move to Las Vegas, Nevada, Sin City to get clean and uh, been clean since. Yeah, that's awesome. You ever go to Pawn Star Shop? No, I, I have not. Dude, so <laughs> I, I went there once and uh, I met Rick. He wore loafer shoes that was like three inches tall. Nice. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty humorous <laughs> uh, man so do, what's your favorite thing to do in vegas it's uh, a good question like what i don't like to do is when friends or family call me and they're like hey let's hang out i'm staying at mgm I'm like man i'm not trying to go to the strip so I, I try to avoid the strip as much as possible locals hate the strip um just because of how busy and chaos it is yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if I were to answer the question, what I like to do in Vegas, it's not like what I do in Vegas is anything different than what other people can do in Cincinnati or, you know, Seattle. It's go to the gym, it's do some hiking, got some cool hiking spots. Um, I like to golf. I'm not good at it, but I, I enjoy it. And uh, yeah, business and family. It's pretty, pretty uh, routine based life. Thank you. Yep. I, I hear you. I'm, I'm not so great at golf anymore after my knee surgery. Oh, shoot. Yeah, it was, oh boy, no. I, I, I thought it would be like riding a bike and it was terrible. <laughs> oh, it, I was praying and spraying all over the course. Hey, man. I'm, I'm right there with you, brother. Right there with you. Well, awesome, man. Thank you so much for joining the show today and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for having me, Evan. Take care.